Welcome to this panel on EU banks after the pandemic, reform and perform. My name is Hannah Brenton. I'm a finance reporter at Politico. Um, we're going to focus on bank capital reforms and the lessons from the pandemic. Um, more specifically, we'll be debating the European Commission's, Commission's proposals to bring the final Basel III global reforms into force in the EU. And we'll talk through the merits of that proposal as well as any lessons from the pandemic for the banking industry, including for non-performing loans and the of capital buffers. Um, I'm very happy to be joined by such a distinguished panel. So with me on site, I have Klaas Knott, President of the Dutch Central Bank and Chair of the Financial Stability Board. Uh, next to him is Jonas Fernandez, a Spanish MEP who is the rapporteur on the Basel III package, and Jose Manuel Camper, Chair of the European Banking Authority. Joining us online, we have Jose Antonio Alvarez, Chief Executive Officer of Santander Group. Thank you very much. Um, so just to, to start, to set the scene a little, we had the European Commission's plans in the autumn. The core of the reforms is the so-called output floor, which limits banks' use of their own internal models to lower capital requirements. European banks feel they'll be hit harder than their international peers and face a substantial capital hike. But the Commission has proposed applying the reforms across banks' books, but uh, included some transitional regimes in areas like low-risk, more Mortgages and unrated corporates. So, class, if I could um, start with you, why do these reforms matter? Why should we be doing this right now? Well, I think, uh, uh, as you called the, uh, the the title of this panel was uh, "Banks After the uh, Pandemic," but I think uh, we should always remind ourselves that we need to go back even ten years earlier, where this all started. Uh, I, I notice also in my environment that memories are beginning to fade. But we had a severe banking crisis in 2008-2009, where the banking sector played the role of shock amplifier. We had a relatively contained problem on a segment of the US mortgage market, which then completely blew out into a global financial crisis. After that, we had a series of uh, financial reforms, uh, a financial reform agenda that was rolled out by the Basel Committee, by the Financial Stability Board, by all the standard setting bodies, of which a significant strengthening of bank capital was an integral element. And I think we can pride ourselves, actually, that if you look at this crisis, that this time around, the banks were no longer the crisis amplifier, they were a shock absorber. And they were capable of continuing to provide lending to the real economy, to keep uh, the real economy afloat, all these corporates that all of a sudden saw their cash flow, flow dry up because of uh, economies going in lockdown, they could turn to the bank and the bank could actually service uh, the higher credit demand. So I think uh, that is all, should always be our starting point. Bank capital matters and a well-capitalized banking system is a system that continues to perform its functions also under stress. Now, already in 2017, the Basel Committee concluded that this reform agenda was not yet complete and there, was still, there were still some open ends. And the reform that is currently on the table, I would call that the capstone of the Basel III reform that has to do uh, with sort of uh, differences in risk weights that could not be well justified uh, looking at the, uh, the differences in, uh, in risk positions, etc. I do feel eh, that this should be seen as an integral part of the proposal to strengthen uh, bank capital. And that's why I continue to believe that we should have full, timely and consistent implementation of the Basel III across the globe. And yes, where risk profiles across the globe differ, of course, there will be some differences in, uh, in bank capital. But I do believe eh, that the Basel Committee has done a great job in trying to chart the individual risk profile of a bank as best as possible. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I believe uh, we should implement it. We will need it also in the future. OK. Jose Manuel, um, you, we've had a little bit of time to digest the Commission's proposals in the EU. So do you think they, they meet that criteria of full, timely, consistent, in line with the Basel Committee? Well, first of all, I think that the important thing is that we have a commission's proposal and we're starting this process so that we can implement it because I think it's important, and Klaus just highlighted this, this is a reform that started in two, as a result of the 2007-2008 crisis and will be implemented finally 
by 2030. So it's 20 years later. So I think it's important that we, that we move on and that we move fast. Now you ask about the full, timely, and consistent. Let me start from the far, from the, from the last part. I think it's consistent implementation. I think it preserves the two key criteria from my point of view that the reform brings into the floor, which, into the, into the uh, argumentation, which is the risk sensitivity of the system. It preserves the risk sensitivity in, in, in the hard parts of the system and, and strengthens particularly the standard approach. You know, I think it also preserves the philosophy of the output floor, which was a very sensitive part of the, of the reform implementation, so that's good. Now, when we think about the timely, I think it's timely, the proposal. It is true as well that we know that uh, right now the proposal is put forward the commission is beyond the original timeline that was put at the Basel Committee. And you know, there was already a one-year postponement from the Basel Committee uh, as a result of the COVID crisis from 2022 to 2023. Now the proposal is going to, uh, the current proposal which is 2025 with maintaining the same uh, adjustment period. So I think that, that this, it'd be better if we're able to at least maintain the initial guideline of the, of the Basel Committee. And I think if we can maybe reduce the transition periods potentially, you know, it's true that the third part is consistency. You know, it's here we will want to make sure that we have a consistent implementation across all jurisdictions. So we want to make sure that the Commission's proposal and our proposal uh, is executed at the same time that the other jurisdictions. Uh, yesterday there was a communicate from the GHOS, from the Governance and Heads of Supervision, that has restated their commitment to uh, making sure that it was a full, timely, and consistent implementation. So I think that we have all expectations that other countries will follow through, but we need to make sure that we follow with them. So that, that, that means that the EU's proposal time-wise should be in line internationally with other jurisdictions? Well, we should make sure that there's consistent implementation, just as I say, you know, the proposal, proposal now is a little bit delayed relative to the, the initial proposal of the, of the Basel Committee. Uh, it's true that other jurisdictions still have to go through the process, so we don't know where they will be at that stage, you know, but I think it's important that we implement as soon as possible because it'll be 20 years by the time the, the proposal is over. I mean, it's fully implemented, all over, it's fully implemented. Okay, moving uh, to the, the industry uh, side of things, Jose Antonio, if I could throw it over to you, you know, what do you make of the commission proposals there? They say they're gonna cap their capital height below 10%. Um, is that something that's manageable for banks or could that cut off lending? Uh, I don't think we can hear you actually. You, I think you're on mute. Yeah. Could you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me in this uh, meeting. Well, uh, um, I, in general terms, uh, I do agree with the what has been said. The, the regulatory drive has been quite long, but uh, as a result of this drive, uh, the banks were better prepared as class said to absorb potential shock from the crisis. But uh, Looking at uh, the, the, the Basel three, I do, uh, and I, my understanding is that there is the, the whole regulatory drive has had too much focus on the stock of capital and not that much focus on the business models and the flow of capital and the access to capital in capital markets. So the stock of capital allow you to absorb shops, shocks, uh, but uh, uh, the, I miss uh, in the regulatory drive, some of these other two items. The 10% you mentioned, uh, I think is, uh, I, I have nothing in particular to say on this. Uh, we see the, the, the open floor and the operational risk and being the two pieces that remain on the table. Uh, um, the transitional agreement is sensible. It's a good approach. Uh, uh, the, as you know, the European banks have been very likely it's going to be more affected than in other jurisdictions, but the transitional arrangements uh, make sense for the internal rate-based models. I miss somehow not to apply this to a standardized approach. And, uh, but uh, uh, having said that, uh, I think um, the sooner we finish the regulatory drive, the better. So uh, uh, then this creates uncertainty, and I, when I meet investors, uh, this is still a plenty of questions, the potential effects going forward, and this is um, uh, is affecting uh, the equity story of the European Bank. So, but having said that, I think it's uh, sensible the approach of the uh, of the Commission, although I do uh, still uh, expect uh, some refining on the proposals they put on the table. Yeah? 
What kind of uh, refinements would you be looking for? Well, I mentioned that the, the transitional arrangements for a standardized approach should be extended to the the transitional arrangements for the uh, internal rate, rating based model should be extended to the standardized approach. Uh, we also have also in in the operational risk field the proposal of the the European Commission of ALM equal to one was uh, very much in line. But uh, we have some proposals, some gratification is needed in the CAP formula in the ILDC uh, that applies to the group level instead of entity level. And the technical guarantees in trade finance uh, maintain the credit counterparty at 20% uh, for technical guarantees should be advisable, mainly in Europe, where the trade finance, the trades, in reality is critical for the region. So facilitate the, the, the finance of the trade in Europe is uh, is something that uh, well is important for the for the whole economy and we miss some of these things yeah okay Honest, there were some suggestions there for um, tweaks to the proposal you're going to be looking at it in the European Parliament so are there areas that you'll be focusing in on in particular okay so first thank you thank you very much for for the invitation it's, it's a pleasure to be here in Paris let me say that maybe the best of the first presidency is giving us the opportunity to to come to, to Paris, and, and there, no, there are many meetings in Paris during this semester. Now, com coming back to the to the topic, I I, I welcome the, the Commission proposal. I think that there is a balanced uh, test, uh, but maybe uh, but maybe this proposal seems more that the final of the trialogue that an initial an initial text, because it's true that the Commission has introduced some aspects, for example, the transitional arrangements, maybe trying to solve some problems in some member states. And, and honestly, and given that, at least my first statement on, 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 on this package is that Europe needs uh, a regulation uh, in line of the Basel, of the Basel recommendation, uh, I fear that given that the Commission has opened this kind of option. Uh, I, let's see how the negotiations uh, go on. Yeah, my, my position as a reporter, as I said, is uh, keeping the, the regulation in the scope as much as possible of the Basel. Uh, the transitional arrangement that the Commission has introduced, given that at least in theory there are temporary uh, maybe I could live with them, uh, but at least in my table is not the that there are not the, the options to, to keep this kind of uh, windows uh, permanently at some member states, and indeed some members in the parliament are, are asking for. Uh, the, the rationality behind the output floor is, is clear. No, after Basel II, uh, supervisors and regulators decided to, to introduce or to, to amplify the risk sensitivities in our, in our models. I think that this was fine. But it's also true that the risk is not a constant. Yeah, the risk is a, a flow variable. And, and what is worse, it's a procyclical variable. So if we uh, really like to have a banking sector safe, and reliable and stable, uh, I think that uh, rationality behind the output floor is, is welcome, and, and, and of course we need to introduce it in, in, our, in our regulation. So you mentioned uh, this the debate about making the transitional regimes permanent. There is a little bit of a push happening in Brussels at the moment, or on one side, to extend those regimes. What, why not do that? Why, why would that be a bad idea? No, first, because uh, the current transitional arrangement is, is a clear deviation from Basel. Yeah? Uh, it's true that maybe we need to give time banks yeah, to, to adapt to the, to the new rules. And, and given this, I, I understand the, the proposal. Yeah? But if, uh, if there is any way to keep them permanently, the deviation will be very, very high. Um, and, and not only for economic reasons or not only for financial reasons, I think that in the last few years we have seen in the in, we have seen <laughs> in in a global uh, matter some uh, I can say some attacks to the international order. Yeah, and and I think that if Europe wants to 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 keep is you no know, our current position, asking for a, a international order based 
on rules and uh, with a clear legitimacy uh, from the of the international institutions uh, i think that not only for economic reasons but also for political reasons europe has to implement basel uh, truly or reliable with our partners yeah class uh, do you agree with that the the transitional regimes if made permanent would be a deviation yeah, I tend to agree with that. Um, I mean, had it been for me, yeah, uh, I would have favoured a full, uh, consistent and timely uh, <laughs> implementation. Um, of course, the Commission is not in an easy position. Eh? We should not ridiculise sort of the challenges that they have to face in, in, in crafting a proposal that is acceptable to all the member states. So perhaps eh, if you have to compromise on one of the three principles <laughs> maybe the least bad one eh, is, is the timing one. But then you should realize that the effect of this is that we had a crisis that had its origin in, uh, in a housing market and that 22, 23 years later, we as regulators have formulated the answer, right? That full implementation eh, will, uh, will only be more than 20 years later. I think that is also from a reputational perspective is a vulnerability. Look also what is happening in many housing markets across the globe today. I don't want to be a doomsayer here, but I mean, housing prices have gone up quite dramatically. That has all been predicated on a interest rate outlook, which is subject to change. Let me put it like that. So uh, I think we should be careful here. And uh, particularly uh, on mortgages, I mean, all the banks always demonstrate very low default rates because there is double materiality in Europe. That's a fair argument in and of itself. But we also know that most of the major banking crises always have a housing aspect to it. And why? Because it's not just the direct probability of default on the bank that is relevant. If you have a housing decline somewhere in your economy, typically it is associated with the slowdown of the economy, a decline in consumer confidence, through which the entire quality of the entire credit portfolio deteriorates. So I would argue eh, that housing risks have a much broader ramification than only the direct effect that is measured in these IRB uh, models. And that's why I think the, these IRB models underestimate housing risks. And that's why I think yeah, we, uh, we welcome very much uh, this out floor that clearly also puts a floor into, uh, yeah, into the capacity of banks to model down uh, risk rates on mortgages. So does that mean that of the transitional options, the one you're least uh, in favor of is the, the low risk mortgages? Correct. Okay. Uh, Jose, and, Jose Manuel, do you um, agree, with, agree with that as well? And if I could ask you also about the consolidation debate. Um, there's a, the Commission proposal applies at the highest level. We're seeing some debate among host nations. How do you kind of solve that problem? Yes. In the first part, I think the answer is pretty I agree with everything that's been said. Mm -hmm. I fully agree that, you know, on the timing of having a transitional arrangement for mortgages is not the best timing. Uh, on the structural basis, the likelihood of making these transitional arrangements uh, temporary is a really dangerous and, and bad path to follow, and I will discourage that. Uh, on the issue that you say about the consolidating arrangement, I think that the Commission had, was funded a clever exercise. You know, if I, if I may just back up for a minute, you know, uh, the Basel Agreement is an agreement that's being agreed internationally to prove global standards for large systemic important institutions to be defined then by every jurisdiction and at consolidated levels of those institutions apply those requirements. Now, we in Europe, in our transposition of Basel, we chose to, we have chosen so far to implement it to a large number of institutions, not just to a large, and also in many, many of the rules at all levels. So, you know, the, whether, the choice whether to pick a consolidated level or not is not a deviation from Basel. It's clearly within Basel to choose the up for the consolidated level. It is clever that they find a mechanism to allocate that capital across the different subsidiaries. I think in the broad that we just had a large, a large uh, conversation with the chair of the Eurogroup. You know, we have a project of banking union. So the consolidated level, the application consolidated level, clearly is a signal to try to get deeper into the blanking union, which I think is a progress in the right direction. So I'm happy about that proposal. Okay. Jose Antonio, uh, what, do you, what do you think about the consolidated uh, level issue? Sounds like a bit more kind of wiggle room there, perhaps. 
Well, this is a question for the entity I work for, uh, very, very relevant. For uh, banks like us that uh, have business not only in the Eurozone, also in emerging markets in the US and UK, uh, well, um, this uh, I'm mo more so being multiple point of entry as we are. Uh, well, we uh, normally try to keep a balance in which all the subsidiaries have enough capital uh, for the business they they are doing. Yeah? So, uh, and for that reason, we uh, try to minimize the gap between the consolidated level of capital at the group level and the capital on each on each of the subsidiaries. The problems we face in some cases is the local regulations. Yeah? So, and the not. Uh, equival equivalence in the recognition of uh, the regulation of other countries, and we face this uh, this problem. Uh, uh, but uh, having said that, we expect to make uh, some progress, as Jose Manuel was saying, at least in the eurozone. So uh, we should make significant progress there, uh, at least uh, with the other jurisdictions. Well, we wonder if. Uh, we're going to be able to match properly this, and the agreement among regulators is going to be in a way that facilitates a business model like ours, that rely on subsidiaries that follow the local regulation. At the same time, our main regulator uh, requires certain levels at the consolidated level. This has some frictions. Uh, till now, we've been able to match, but, uh, well, we will see if the mutual equivalence is recognized at least among the, the major countries. Yeah? So, so that uh, is important for us uh, in the way we match our business. Yeah? Okay. If I could also just uh, encourage the audience, we're about halfway through the panel, to you know, submit uh, any questions via the Swapcard app. This is your opportunity to, to ask anything to the panel. Um, but changing the topic slightly, um, bank... Oh, so you want to respond to that one? Yeah, go for it. No, it's... No, I, I, I tend to agree that, uh, of course, the proposal of the Commission is, is well based, taking into account the negotiation of the advances of the banking union that we need. But I also understand some concerns in host countries uh, without many, many years, without, no, without any advancement in the negotiation of the European Deposit Insurance Scheme. Uh, because it's true that nowadays the regulation, the supervision, uh, the resolution no, are decided at a European level, but if there is any kind of problem in any bank, at the end of the day, the national taxpayers will be who will have to pay uh, the, the problem. Yeah? So, so even if, of course, from the banking union perspective, the proposal is well-oriented, I, I think that maybe we could introduce in the, in the regulation some incentives to advance faster in the negotiation of the European Deposit Insurance Scheme. And indeed, we could introduce even uh, other capital and liquidity waivers in the, in the CRR, uh, but of course, all of that subject to the implementation of the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, because otherwise, uh, the, the banking union is not balanced, yeah? and, 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 and I think that we need, <laughs> we need more. Is there a risk if it gets too hooked on the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, it gets very politically difficult, though we've had so many difficulties with that particular topic? Uh, the political problems are clear, yeah. Uh, the proposal from the Commission is in 2015, 2016, yeah, so... A while ago. <laughs> <laughs> so after five, six years, uh, the proposal is there. Uh, until now, there is not so much aptitude in the Council, neither in the, in the Parliament, to, to advance in the negotiation of this matter. Uh, but honestly, I think that if we, if, if we really think that uh, the banking union needs to, to, to advance, uh, I appreciate so much the Commission proposal on the output floor, uh, but maybe we could introduce other waivers in, in, the same, in, the same, in the same rationality. But for doing this, I think that we need more advancing in the, in the, the, no, in the negotiation of the European Deposit Insurance Scheme. Um, and the debate, uh, no, in the debate there are other elements, uh, uh, but uh, we need to do it. Okay. Changing the topic slightly, um, banks, uh, as we said earlier, have kind of broadly weathered 
the pandemic. Um, the ECB had its SHREP results out earlier, and it said capital and liquidity ratios are actually higher than, than pre-pandemic. Um, but we have seen a lot of warnings about potential non-performing loans coming through. Previously, it was uh, you know the predictions of a possible wave, but that hasn't really materialized. So Jose Manuel, you know, are we out of the woods on, on non-performing loans? Well, as, as you say, you know, the situation so far for the banking sector has been positive. I would say, fortunately, much better than we probably had anticipated two years ago when the crisis started. And we're happy that that's the case. We're happy that we planned for the worst and the outcome was better than we expected. Uh, a lot of that is obviously due to the real exceptional measures that were put by monetary policy and fiscal policy that have helped and the banks were there to channel those messages properly to the population that could get to the citizens and that has helped throughout the process. Uh, having said all that, uh, the, as you say, you know, the current status of the banks is uh, capital ratios are higher than at the beginning of the crisis, liquidity ratios are good, NPL ratios actually have declined. One comment I'd like to make on that point is that NPL ratios are declining because the high stock of NPLs in some of the banks in countries with very high stock of NPLs from the previous crisis have still continued to be able to download some of those NPLs from their balance sheet, and that's a good, good development. They still need to progress in that way. Having said all that, we're still concerned about the potential effects from the, from the existing coming out of the COVID crisis might have on the banking sector. You know, most of the moratoriums have already expired, but we still have about 350 billion euros of loans under public guarantee schemes that need to be uh, worked through. You know, how many of those are really going to, at the end, need the public guarantee scheme, how they going to be restructured, that's a challenge. So we think that that's an area of concern. We published our stress test in July of last year. The outcome was, overall, I would say, quite positive. So we are morally optimistic, but there's concerns out there. Having said that, and I know this is about Basel, but I just want to bring another point, which is in 20 years, a lot has happened in our society, and in particular in technology. <laughs> and I think we need to think also about how we think about the banking sector and the role that it will play going forward beyond the Basel capital requirements in these other areas. And I think there, the challenge for transformation of businesses, the challenge for transformation of the industry is still very large and remains large. You know? And this may be a topic for another day, but I think it's important that we keep that in mind as well. Okay. The digital euro is there. <laughs> Sorry, say that again? No, the digital euro is, is there, no? it's part of this debate. That's true. Um, Class, uh, we also had this issue in the, in the pandemic about the usability of capital buffers. Yeah. Um, is this work that's been done internationally at this point? Are you, are you thinking about this at the FSB? Well, we are thinking about this. Uh, I, would, I would say more in a European context yet than in a global context, but it is a very relevant development. I think uh, thus far I've been very sort of upbeat uh, about the role that the banking sector has played uh, during the crisis. But of course, every crisis teaches you something. And I do think uh, there is still an improvement uh, possible when it comes to re releasability of buffer. If you look at the, uh, the balance between minimum requirements, which is hard capital that always needs to be there, and buffers that are releasable, then uh, we went into the uh, crisis, I believe in Europe, with less than 0.2% of risk-weighted assets in terms of counter-cyclical buffers. So, we wanted to release buffers at the beginning of the pandemic, but there were almost no releasable buffers. In the Netherlands, we were pragmatic. We took part of our systemic risk buffer, which was in principle a non-releasable buffer. We converted it overnight into a counter-cyclical buffer, and then overnight we also released the counter-cyclical buffer so that we could release some capital, which was well initially not meant to be released. We will now restock the counter-cyclical buffer. We've consulted on a framework to do so, and I think uh, very shortly uh, we will also come with an announcement on sort of the quantitative parameters of restocking this uh, counter-cyclical buffer. But I think that is an issue where the, uh, the ex ex example of the Netherlands is illustrative also for uh, many European countries. So we have to think harder about having a structure for uh, uh, counter-cyclical capital and that needs to be capital where you have a positive counter-cyclical buffer in a standard risk environment, not a zero uh, counter-cyclical buffer in a standard risk environment, because then you cannot release anything if you have a negative shock hitting your economy. So that, for me, is the main thing uh, that we, on the banking side we have to look in in, uh, in the coming years. Jose Antonio, that's, that's something you can agree with, I guess? Is that something you're... No, no, not sure. No, 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 not for sure, yeah. So I think... <laughs> that the current capital requirements have buffers on buffers. 
Yeah. So, um, and to keep adding buffers is not going to facilitate the competitiveness of the European banks. Um, it's going to deteriorate. Um, as I said at the beginning, the focus is too much on the stock of capital and too little in the business model and the, the capital flows. And I, my suggestion as a practitioner is uh, making sure uh, I understand the point of usability of the buffers. We cannot use the buffers because they come with a stigma. And immediately you need to rebuild the buffer and the market looks at this on a fully loaded basis. So in reality, you use the buffer, you are short of capital for the amount of the buffer you use. Okay, so I, I, I do think that keeping, keep uh, going, accumulating capital on the bank uh, balance sheets only facilitates the disintermediation that is happening across many actors that are not regulated or not regulated or, un, or not having the same uh, regulation and they become extremely competitive vis-a-vis -vis with the bank. You, you need to hold an extraordinary amount of capital and other players in the market don't have the, such a regulation, very likely they're going to become, uh, they're going to compete with the banks. Um, well, the banks, maybe the banks do, do not have a crisis, uh, but uh, this doesn't mean that the economy doesn't go into trouble because other actors in the financial landscape uh, uh, go into trouble. I don't want, I don't, um, I cannot imagine a crisis in the private equity world uh, where plenty of pension funds are investing, uh, lightly uh, regulated or non-regulated, and they grew, I don't know, 10 times, 20 times since the financial crisis. Uh, and there are uh, the asset management industry that, well, if uh, they say, liquidity run in some of this uh, or, or a, a credit crisis that affects this industry. I don't want to, uh, 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 how do you protect the investors there that are retail investors, uh, deposit-like type of investments. We protect the deposits, but not this investment that are deposit-like investments, like the money market funds, fixed income funds, and um, as I said before, the pension. So I do, I do think that too much regulation has been uh, already uh, uh, put on the, the, the banks and too little on the rest of the actors in the economy. And the next crisis, maybe you get banks well, well, very well protected and, 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 and you have the same effects on the whole economy and uh, maybe also in, on the taxpayers because if uh, the, the, the risk is there. The risk didn't go, didn't go away, just changed from one hand to another. Does anybody want to come back on that? Too much focus, too much regulation of the banks, the risks have shifted elsewhere. Honas, do you want the last word before we wrap up? No, it's not an easy question. No, it's, it's true that not even that banks take deposits, uh, they suffered uh, some regulation that other financial uh, actors uh, don't, don't suffer. Yeah? Uh, and in some cases, as Jose Antonio said, it's, it's true that uh, our regulation can produce um, no, 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 unintended consequences, yeah. Uh, but, but in any case, uh, the current regulation on banking, I think that is having working well uh, during this crisis. As my colleague said, uh, the banking sector uh, w was not an amplifier of the crisis, uh, but no, in contrary, uh, they absorbed the, the crisis better in another. Uh, previous recession, uh, so the regulation is flexible, and indeed, co-legislators passed the quick fix in 2020 yeah, to adapt some, some rules and facilitate the, the supervision from the from no, from the central bankers and the activity of the bank entities. Yeah. Klaus, you wanted to jump in? Yes, because I believe at the FSB we are exactly doing what Mr. Alvarez suggested. Uh, after uh, the events of March 2020, when it was indeed the non-bank financial intermediation, intermediation sphere where the vulnerabilities emerged, there is now a comparable financial reform agenda uh, focusing on NBFI 
than the reform agenda we had after the 2007-2008 crisis that focused on banks. We have reforms in money market funds, in open-ended funds, in margining practices, in corporate bond market liquidity. There is a whole sort of work program that the FSB had, has laid out and which will come to fruition uh, in 2022. Or already on money market funds, we consulted uh, first uh, proposals. Open-ended funds will follow shortly. So this is exactly what we are currently doing at the Financial Stability Board. OK, it's some agreement then at the end of the panel on <laughs> where to focus attention. Thank you so much to all of you for, for taking part. Um, if I could uh, invite you to stick around for the next panel on Solvency 2. We will be back shortly. For those in the room, if you could stay seated and, uh, yeah, come back, come back to us in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.